Hello, kids. Ready for another adventure in Bible history? Okay. Now, last week, we spoke about the type of government Israel had. Do you remember what it was called? That's right. It was called a theocracy because God was the leader and king of the people. Today, we'll talk about how they changed from a theocracy to a monarchy. Do you know what a monarchy is? Hmm. Let's see. A monarchy is a type of government that is ruled by one person who is called a king or queen, or maybe an emperor. Monarchs usually reign for their entire lives. And since monarchies are often dynasties, when the monarch dies, their title goes to their oldest son or daughter. But the monarchy that Israel had wasn't absolute. This means that the kings couldn't rule alone or with unlimited power. God was still in charge. And because they didn't make the laws, the monarchy of the Israelites was another part of their theocracy. It was never God's intention to have kings in Israel, but he knew the people would one day ask for one. Therefore, he allowed the people to have kings, but gave them strict rules to follow. First of all, God himself chose the king. Secondly, the king was required to read the laws God gave them every day, so he would know how to judge the people with wisdom. Lastly, the king should be from among the people and should not follow the customs of the world. He needed to be an example to Israelites of humility and obedience to God. After all, the king was another symbol of Jesus Christ. We'll learn more about how the people decide to have a king rule over them as we listen into the prophet Samuel speaking with his friend Elimelech. Hello, Samuel. I heard you anointed Saul from the tribe of Benjamin as king of Israel. That was a surprise for me. Oh, thank you for coming over, Elimelech. Yes, that's true. God chose Saul as king. The people got what they wanted. Saul is tall, handsome, and looks strong. The people now feel like they are equal with other countries of the world. But what they don't realize is that if they continue to follow the world, they will become like the world. But how did this happen? Well, all the elders of Israel came to me and told me that they wanted a king so that they could be like all the other nations. Oh, I'm so sad because they used my mistakes as a father as an excuse to reject God as their king. I know that my sons are not the best example. I've tried my best to teach them to be obedient to God, but they just won't listen. I feel like such a failure. <sighs> my friend, Israel should be ashamed of themselves. Since the age of five, you have served Israel faithfully. You have worked tirelessly for their good. You've been their high priest, their prophet, their judge. Why, you even started the school of the prophets. The first one was right here in Ramaha. You've been obedient to God in all things and helped to keep Israel away from idolatry and all the evil practices that will ruin them. That is true, Elimelech. But I do it out of love for God and for my people. I cried to God in my frustration and sadness. But he told me that the people didn't reject me. They rejected him. They want to be like the world and don't want to be different from other nations. They want a king who will lead them into battle. Um, that's right. They've been wanting a king for some time now. Hmm, let's see. Yes, all the way back when Gideon was a judge. What was that? Uh, about a hundred years ago, Israel was already asking for a king. Yes, yes, I remember. After God helped Gideon tear down the altars of Baal 
and deliver the Israelites from attack by the Midianites, Israel asked Gideon to be their king. But he refused. He told them that God would rule over them. He knew Israel should never be ruled by anyone but God. His sons also refused to be made king. Ah, uh, but Abimelech didn't refuse. Even though he didn't live with Gideon's sons, he was more than eager to become king. So much so that he even killed all but one of his 17 brothers to become king. The desire for power leads to terrible sins. Agreed. But the time has come. The people want a king and God has chosen one for them and authorized me to anoint him. God knew that this day was going to come. But did you tell them what consequences would be for their choice? Oh, yes, I told them. I warned them that the king will take away freedoms from his people. He'll take their sons to fight for him in battle and make their daughters to bake for him in his palace. He'll take their fields, their vineyards, their donkeys, their sheep. Oh, and so much more. A king will take more than he will give. But they didn't want to listen. Oh, how I fear for Israel. But talking about Saul, didn't God choose him as a king? That is God's will. Not necessarily, Elimelech. You see, when people are blind and demand their own way without listening to godly reason, God gives them what they want so that they can see their foolishness and have the opportunity to repent of their sin. In that case, I only hope and pray that Saul remains faithful and obedient to God. I hope so too, Elimelech. His example will determine how the people behave. Thank you for stopping by. Goodbye. Well, kids, we've learned that God allowed the people of Israel to have a king and asked them to obey him. God gave Israel the chance to be a leader and an example for other nations, but they chose not to and turned their backs on him and chose instead to become slaves of a king. And when some kings rebelled against God, the people also worshipped the images, transgressed God's commandments, and went far away from God. That's why God rejected the monarchy and allowed other nations and other kings to humble the people of Israel and help them learn important lessons. You know the name Elimelech means God is my king. And even though we don't live under a theocracy today, God should still be king of our lives. Yes, we must obey the laws of the country we live in, but not before God's law. If the law of our country contradicts the law of God, we must obey God first. Hey, maybe you feel like you are different from your friends or family members who don't believe in God. Maybe you think that by copying what they do, you'll be accepted and feel happier. But let me tell you something. The best thing you can do is stay faithful to God, no matter what. Don't be afraid to be different. Instead, dare to defend your faith and share the good news that Jesus is your king. I have an idea. Why don't you write a list of five things that you do as a Christian that make you different from your non-Christian friends? Show this list to your parents and ask them to explain to you why each difference is really an advantage for you. Stay faithful to our King!